Today on UW360, making beautiful music from pollution? How one UW grad student is using music to draw attention to a global issue. Plus, college finals week is going to the dogs. See how these furry friends are helping students manage the stress of their college finals. Also, the story behind an infamous event in Seattle's history and how UW Libraries is helping keep that story alive. Plus, it's all in the family on this Husky baseball diamond. All that and more on today's UW 360. Hi everyone, from the University of Washington, I'm Carolyn Douglas. Welcome to UW 360. Did you know there are more than 200 kinds of headaches? And far too many of us know firsthand just how debilitating they can be, often bringing life to a grinding halt. But help is on the way. The UW Medicine Neurosciences Institute's Headache Clinic is helping patients get back to their lives. And as Stacy Sakamoto reports, the first step is finding out what triggers each person's headache. 15 to 30 million people in the United States suffer from chronic headaches. I can remember having migraines since I was about uh, 15 years old. People with chronic headaches have more than 15 every month. I was experiencing migraine headaches nearly every day. The headaches were painful and debilitating. If I were to put them on a scale of 1 to 10, um, the daily headaches were probably on maybe a 6, and then sometimes they would get up to an 8 or a 9. Michael Simonson says he was unable to work more than one day a week when he sought treatment at UW Medicine Neurosciences Institute's headache clinic. So you've started using the cephaly. Dr. Natalia Murinova is its director. We're seeing incredible epidemic of uh, young people and uh, most of the headaches affect uh, women in their productive years, um, starting being 14 or 15, but we're seeing a number of young men as well. That is a, a Dr. Muranova and nurse practitioner Melissa Shorn team up to provide shared visits at the UW Medicine Roosevelt Clinic. Maybe there's a certain vitamin or something that I'm, that I'm missing. So it's an innovative way for several patients to receive care at the same time. It's nice for patients to be able to share their own story and what's worked for them or what's not worked for them. And it's, it's a shared experience for our patients. They learn about what causes headaches. Yeah, there's, there's some medical founding for that, for that advice. It turns out that Michaels were caused by overuse of over-the-counter headache medicine. It actually turns out that over-the-counter medication, if you have more than four headache days per month, is your worst option because that actually leads to more headaches. Uh, so actually one of the first things that we start after establishing your diagnosis is uh, figuring out alternatives to the over-the-counter medications that you have been uh, taking. Michael has given up the over-the-counter medication. Instead, Dr. Muranova has prescribed preventative medication and has suggested non-medication options. He's more than 99% improved. How he achieved that was a combination of daily preventive medication along with um, changes in diet. We have a nutrition shared visit along with daily exercise, along with um, using melatonin for his sleep. But if they're willing to work hard, and our patients are willing to work hard, they uh, achieve enormous success, and we're very proud of them. My advice to people that are experiencing migraines is to seek treatment far earlier than I did. I, I suffered through migraines for more than half of my life, and needlessly. What I like about my work is getting people not only out of pain, but back to their lives. Because I've had such a positive outcome, I want to share that with other people. I want to let them know it's possible. Dr. Muranova emphasizes that finding out what works for each person takes time and work for both her and the patient. Still to come, using music to help sound the alarm about global warming. Plus, why the UW baseball team truly is a family affair with dad and sons all in the same dugout. 
and how man's best friend is helping students cope with the stress of college finals as UW360 continues. This portion of UW360 is presented by UW Medicine Neurosciences Institute. The following UW360 story is made possible by the generous support of BECU. BECU, more than just money. Welcome back to UW360. What does carbon pollution sound like? A graduate student at the UW Department of Atmospheric Sciences composed an answer to that question in what may be the first music video of its kind. With the help of her advisor, she turned the measurements of the rising levels of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere into music. As the carbon dioxide levels rise, so does the pitch of the music, which can make for an unsettling and unforgettable message. Listen carefully to the relentless rise of carbon pollution in the Earth's atmosphere. Thanks to this unique music video, you can actually hear it happening. You can see how it's moving through the atmosphere, uh, traveling in the jet stream. Yeah, it does sound relentless. UW it? graduate student Judy Tweet is the composer of what may be the first music video of its kind. Her advisor, UW scientist Dargan Frierson, and the video team at the Department of Atmospheric Sciences were her production team. Yeah. By using sonification, the process of turning data into sound, they created this music video, the deafening rise of carbon dioxide. Nobody hears or smells or sees carbon dioxide. We measure the concentration and then we choose how to make sense of that data. And almost always we choose to make sense of it visually. So, you know, this is just an exploration in, in hearing it instead of seeing it. It was Judy's idea to use sonification to better convey the urgency of rising carbon pollution levels spewing into Earth's atmosphere, allowing viewers to not only see the data, but feel it. When we hear sounds, we're, we're hearing vibrations. They resonate in our bodies. So it's no surprise that when Judy was trying to think of a more creative way to communicate the urgency of rising carbon pollution to a non-scientific community, she turned to music as her medium. The result is uniquely powerful. The Earth seemingly shouting a message. The steady, unstoppable rhythm. The rising carbon levels get increasingly higher, causing viewers' anxiety to rise along with them. I've been really um, intrigued by a lot of people saying, wow, you know, this, I've never, never really thought about it that way. I've never thought about how it sounds. And yet it ends on a hopeful note, reminding us of solutions, switching to clean energy sources, and better protecting our oceans and forests, helping Earth breathe again. There's no single answer to this problem of global warming, but we need lots of people using their, their special skills and their creative energies to work on it. And so I hope that it just spurs that a little bit more. And if words can't convince people to act quickly enough, maybe music can. Judy is planning to use sonification to create more YouTube videos to help better communicate other environmental issues, like the rise of Earth's temperature. You can see her videos and those of her colleagues on the Department of Atmospheric Sciences website and YouTube channel. Just check out the link on our website. All right, from feeling the stress of rising pollution to coping with the stress of finals. Four times a year, students at the University of Washington go through that dreaded time known as finals week. And as anyone who's gone through it well knows, it can be very stressful. But now there's a fluffy new fad sweeping through campus to help. De-stressing with dogs. Austin Seedentoff has the story. <laughs> I want it to snuggle with in my bed so I can sleep. <laughs> it's like with. your blanket. 
More and more organizations like the Student Club Huskies for Suicide Prevention and Awareness are inviting therapy dogs to campus to help take the edge off of the stressors of life in college. University students being in like such an environment where it's like high stresses and like all this pressure on them. It feels good. It just kind of takes your mind out of like the stress from findings after like all that. People think that it is normal or common for college students to feel depressed or to stress out because you are college students, and it is not. Oh, he likes you. During the week before finals, usually it's called dead week, but we want to rename it to stress less week instead. Yeah, she cannot whisper without wagging her tail. Whisper. <laughs> These therapy dogs and their owners are volunteering their time as a part of College Dogs, an organization started by champion breeder and trainer Lori Hardman. This happens during midterms, finals, other times of stress. We get called to campus, generally speaking, two to three days a week throughout the entire school year. And I can't tell you how many times I hear, oh, I, I can go do my studies now, or I feel so much better just from petting the dog. When I'm playing with dogs, like, they allow me to just focus in that one moment instead of thinking about other things that are going on in my life. Many call this, focusing on therapy dogs to drown out stressors, anchoring. Good girl. A technique which saved the life of assistant director of the Student Veterans Center, Lindsay Zeich. Because I just needed something to keep me going. Because at that point, like I was at my, like some of my lowest days, like I was, there was a point where I was even suicidal. Um, but I couldn't, I couldn't get out of it. Lindsay has left those times behind her, and now she brings one of her dogs to work with her, where they've become fast friends with staffers on her floor in the hub. 15 to 20 percent of her time is spent keeping me grounded. Um, where 80, 85% of her time is spent um, in the office, hanging out with other veterans. Spending time with dogs is great for dealing with stress. It could change your day, or even your life for the better, which is why it looks like therapy dogs will be here to stay at the UW. Once a year, Lindsay helps coordinate an event called Service Dogs Unleashed through the Office of Student Veteran Life. It happens on the lawn outside the Husky Union building where students can stop by to romp with Fido and friends. Still ahead, play ball with the family who's helping put the Huskies on the National College baseball map. Plus a look back at an infamous story in Seattle's history. A union leader is assassinated, a foreign leader is implicated, and the UW Library Archives saves the story as UW 360 continues. Support for UW360 is provided by the Labor Archives of Washington. Learn more about researching at the Labor Archives and donating collections at laborarchives.org. Welcome back to UW360. The Cannery Workers and Farm Laborers Union has been a powerful voice for working people since 1933. And the fight for fair employment hasn't always been peaceful. A labor organizer and UW alum found himself at the center of a tragic event that shook Seattle in 1981. Now a scholarship from the Harry Bridges Center for Labor Studies is carrying forward that man's legacy and turning a tragic loss into a potential future for a UW student. Uh, Allison, if you could please come up. Allison Steakin stands before a packed ballroom to accept a scholarship. After almost a decade away from school at the UW, working dockside as a casual longshore worker. Allison's scholarship has been awarded by the Harry Bridges Center for Labor Studies, recognizing her work with the International Longshore and Warehouse Union and her commitment to a future working in labor. The Harry Bridges Center was one of the reasons I came back at the time that I did. I felt a true calling between what I was trying to accomplish as a casual longshoreman and then take that further. How can I contribute to this industry? How can I use my talents um, to make it a better place? The labor movement's always been a very important player in Washington State, even before we were a state. Some of the biggest events in Seattle history turn on labor activism. Allison is carrying the legacy of one of those events forward. Her scholarship is named for Jean Viernes and UW alumnus Silme Domingo, who died in 1981 fighting for reform in their Cannery Workers Union, a historically Filipino-American organization, which was no longer protecting its own workers the way it once had. 
Terry Mast, Somay's wife, remembers. Uh, the union did all the dispatching, mainly the dispatching of, of the workers to the canneries. And that is where a lot of the bribery would happen. They would pick and choose, and how they picked sometimes was by, you know, people passing money or other things. Somay and Jean were leaders of a movement to take back control of their Pacific Northwest Union, organizing discrimination suits, encouraging others to run for office, and connecting to exploited laborers in the Philippines under the Ferdinand Marcos dictatorship. That did come up on the agenda about um, taking a, a position or a stance on uh, workers in the Philippines and what they were, what conditions were they working under and trying to build relations with the labor movement there. But that was not something that the leadership of the union um, thought should be involved. It also infuriated the infamous Philippines president, Marcos. He conspired with union president, Tony Baruso, and on June 1st, 1981, both Silme and Jean were gunned down in Seattle. And it was a, you know, a sensational murder, got a lot of publicity, especially among Asian Americans, and a big funeral. It actually helped, you know, in a sad way that martyrs do to solidify the union and bring them together. Gene and Silmay's sacrifice inspired Terry and the other reformers on to victory. The union was reclaimed and some measure of justice was served. Four hitmen are all in prison. They got life without parole. Uh, Tony Bruso, after uh, the civil suit, uh, the prosecuting attorney finally agreed to go after him, found him guilty as well, and he went to prison. And he died a few years ago. And unfortunately, Marcos died before the civil suit, but uh, was found guilty and, yeah. This is the legacy that Allison is carrying forward with her scholarship, and it seems like she's already ready to go. Because you get down there and you listen to the old timers talk, you know, and their stories and everything come through when they teach you. So you really learn the history through the oral history, through people that have been there and done it. 10 years, I would like to be a labor uh, labor attorney in labor law. If that doesn't happen, I'd like to be a union organizer. Documents, oral histories, and photos from the cannery workers' reform, some written by Silmay and Jean, as well as the records of the cannery workers' union and the papers of members and officers of the union are all available to the public at the Labor Archives of Washington at UW. To learn more, visit their website at thelaborarchives.org, which we've also linked to our site at UW360. Straight ahead, the boys of summer are one big happy family at UW, literally. Up next, meet UW baseball coach Lindsey Meggs and his boys as we head to the baseball diamond when UW360 continues. Welcome back to UW360. For many, the love of baseball can be traced back to a game of catch between parent and child. And for UW baseball head coach Lindsey Meggs, that love of the game was passed down to his sons, who are now giving back to their dad every day on the Husky Diamond. Producer Rick Garza has this UW baseball family affair. My family uh, uh, loves the game of baseball. They love all the sports. For Lindsey Meggs and his entire family, playing a sport was a large part of growing up. We played soccer, basketball, football, baseball, and it was just fun for us as kids to have each other to compete with and against. And I just remember going to my brother's games, my sister's games, and then obviously going to our dad's games too, and it was just, it was nonstop, and that's how I wanted it as a kid. Many fathers coach their kids in Little League, but that was something the senior Megs missed when his sons were younger. Still, it didn't stop him from passing his love for the game to sons Joe and Jack. He never coached us in Little League, but he was always helping us with baseball or throwing the football, basketball, that kind of stuff. And while he wasn't on the field coaching our team, I mean, he was always throwing us BP and we're always working on stuff with him and always around. When Joe Meggs decided to play baseball on a collegiate level, he wanted to play for his dad. And when youngest son Jack came along, UW baseball truly became a Meg's family affair. 
You know, it's, it's really a unique thing, but coaching them is, is a double-edged sword. I've had some of the greatest moments I could ever imagine in this profession and as a dad in that dugout with my sons, and I've had some of the most difficult moments. I mean, there isn't much in between. Today, Joe Meggs works off the field for his dad as director of baseball operations. When I got done playing, I still wanted to be involved in the game, and this was kind of the path that I chose to take, and uh, I think it's something that I want to pursue, and I mean, I, I definitely am in a good position now to learn from not only my dad, but our other assistant coaches. Coming out of high school, Jack Meggs had opportunities to go elsewhere, but decided he too wanted to play for dad. Kind of wanted to go somewhere else when I was younger and, you know, kind of make my own name. And as I got older, I saw my brother go through uh, what he did playing here. And I mean, I just saw how much joy those two had and their relationship grew from it so much that I, mean, I didn't want to miss out on that and miss out on that opportunity of getting to see my dad every day. Coaching your sons can be tough for father and son. Having him in the dugout at times and, you know, getting barked at a little bit and then transferring that to going and having dinner with my family on Sunday nights. You know, that's tough love in our, in our household. It's tough love on the field, and I think our players have been better because of that, and, and uh, I think my, my boys have been better because of that. But I think it's made me a better person around the kids. It's made me more patient. It's made me more understanding. It's made me more forgiving. And when he stops to reflect, Lindsey Meggs is proud of his family and how they've handled being a baseball family. The sacrifices they've made you know, to make this my career and, and to build our family around it, that makes me feel better about the choices we've made. Who knows, if the ball bounces the right way, this may just be the beginning of the Meggs era at the University of Washington. I couldn't imagine myself being away from the game just because it's helped shape my life so much and my family's life that I'm going to want to stay involved. I mean, my brother might be running the show in a few years, but who knows. Under his leadership, Coach Meggs has grown the University of Washington into one of the top programs in the Pac-12 and one of the top teams in the country. And that does it for this edition of UW360. If you'd like more information on any of the stories you saw today, just head to our website at uwtv.org slash uw360. You'll also find us on Facebook and Twitter. I'm Carolyn Douglas. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time with all new stories from the University of Washington.